Okay, so today we're speaking to Sarah, who's um, employed by People Potential and Possibilities, which I understand is an arm of probation. So you work with um, people who are sort of perhaps involved in the criminal lifestyle and try and help them to rehabilitate and sort of find their way. Yep. If I'm incorrect on that, just tell me. <laughs> yeah, so right. could you just kind of explain why you got into that sort of work? Um, it's been quite a long journey really. Um, I first started out as an ex-offender back in about 10 years ago. Um, it was my probation officer at that time that put me forward for a new initiative called the Health Training Project. Mm -hmm. um, so I started out in Southampton back in, it must have been 2008, um, and worked basically over the last 10 years within the probation service in different roles, health trainer, education and training officer, and then um, probation officer now as P3 as a senior link worker. Yeah. So what, um, if you don't mind speaking about it, um, you said that you were on probation. Did you have have you got a sort of story to tell that sort of makes you a good person to work in probation? Um, I guess it's mainly about my own life experiences. Um, for quite a long time, I kind of emotionally have been quite up and down, especially teenage years, mm -hmm. like you do. Um, in my twenties, had quite a lot of issues around alcohol and drugs, which kind of led to a point where I was using something probably every day from 20 up until I was 31. Mm -hmm. um, at the time it wasn't like an intentional, right, okay, things aren't going very well, so I'm just gonna use alcohol and drugs to mask everything. But looking back now, that was definitely kind of what was happening for me. Um, that culminated in quite a few bad decisions along the way. Too many to mention here today. Um, and then, yeah, unfortunately I offended. It was uh, theft, theft by employee. Um, subsequently lost my job at that time and then ended up on probation. Finally having to sit down and face my fears, really my own situation and trying to address the things that were underlying that led me to that point. Yeah. So I guess for me, that journey, um, various life experiences along the way gave me some really good training to be able to then um, support other people that were on probation to, to move forward, yeah. And would you say that you um, find your job rewarding? I love it, yeah. yeah. Prior to starting working in criminal justice, um, I'd had random jobs, I'd worked in security, um, did some reset, retail security work, but always was interested in what had led people really to that point where they felt they needed to shoplift. A lot of the cases I dealt with at that point was, you know, around substance misuse, um, people that had been using heroin and stuff. But I never felt like I was really able to make a difference then. It was just, I wanted to be more of a, you know, part of a solution. So, and I always wanted to maybe work with helping other people. Um, and that seemed like something that I wanted to get involved with. So if you're looking at um, perhaps somebody who's constantly offending, how, how, how would you help them? If, for instance, if they're in prison, would you visit and see what the hurdles are to the, um, kind of make going back to criminality the easier option? Yeah, um, particularly with P3 as our job now, um, we will go and visit people in prison. If we get, they usually get referred by their probation officer. Um, so yeah, we go and complete our assessment when someone's in prison, maybe look at some of the circumstances that have led to those, that offence, um, and then work out on a practical level kind of some of the things of you know, why they may go back to that lifestyle. Usual thing, especially for prolific offenders, is a lack of accommodation. They might have been around the system a few times, um, but it's looking at whether they're motivated to change, which majority of people are when we go and see them. It's very rare if they say, mm, not interested, want to keep doing the same thing. And then we work behind the scenes alongside the resettlement teams within the prisons and their probation officer to come up with a, a strong release plan so mm -hmm. that they've got every opportunity they can to make that change if they're willing and ready. Because there must be a lot of people in prison um, who perhaps need help with their mental health. Yep. In my experience, 99% of people that end up in prison have got some kind of mental health issue. 
be it that they're not coping very well, they're using unhelpful coping strategies, um, yeah, or that they're using substances to manage their emotions at some level, or they're just quite chaotic and just, yeah. And I'm trying to think if, um, if you've had a chaotic lifestyle, and perhaps you, you and I can read and write, and we know how to fill out a form, so I suppose if you've had a chaotic lifestyle, there could be a lot of people who've got undiagnosed mental health, but also can't fill out a form to get accommodation. Yep. Um, and actually it must be quite a scary world for them. And yep. that's why it's sometimes easier to hide with um, unhealthy coping mechanisms, i.e. using drugs. Yep. I think all of us are guilty of kind of sticking to the things that we know, the things that we find safe, the habits, the kind of, the people, the things that we think, yeah, we can just do this at that certain level. I don't know if it's your friends down the pub, if it's your family, if you've got a decent family. And equally, I think if if you're somebody who's been brought up in a in a family, in a childhood that's been surrounded by kind of parents that have used heroin, crack, cannabis, um, that's kind of, you grow up and that's all you know. Yep, You're good. desensitised to that. It's not something for maybe you and I, or for me particularly, the thought of being around crack and heroin at the age of seven or eight is something that I can't even imagine. A lot of my clients, you know, at some level, especially in their childhood, they've had contact through family members that have been using heroin, crack, or they've started themselves experimenting with drugs at a really young age, seven, eight, nine. Um, and that's become something that's familiar to them, that's become a way of life, the lifestyle that goes with that. Um, that's all they know, they come out and that's partly just what is familiar and what they would do, let alone the additional stresses of, I've got nowhere to go tonight, I've got somewhere to go, but that means I'm staying with Joe Bloggs that also drinks or uses drugs. If they want to make a change and stop that, it's going to be very difficult with that kind of setup straight away. Um, you're right with the reading and writing stuff. I think it's something like 76% of the uh, prison population have got a reading age of an 11 year old. The system as we know it, the forms for benefits, the system for benefits, especially universal credit, going to housing, filling out accommodation forms, the system in the prisons for actually getting the support they need to, you know, on the outside the resettlement is just all very long, difficult, yeah. And I suppose all those things almost make it really impossible. You, it almost makes you want to run and hide. Yeah. Because it's almost must seem um, you can't overcome it. Yeah. Many a time I've gone into prison to see my clients, and I thought seriously about their situation and thought you know what would I how would I feel even with you know a reasonably stable friends family around me how would I feel to be stood at that prison gate with I don't know my discharge grant of 50 quid or whatever in my pocket not knowing where I'm going to stay clothes. tonight yeah the clothes I was taken into custody in you know that haven't been washed that are minging I don't know where I'm going to stay tonight I've got a couple of friends that might let me stay but I'm not sure about that. I haven't got a phone. I might have a phone, but it's not been charged up. I've got to run to my probation appointment. Um, I need to set up my benefits claim. I, or I can just go to the pub because actually I'm that stressed out and anxious about what I've got to do today. I can just go to the pub and I'm just going to have one drink. But we all know that won't just be the one drink. That's going to be three or four. And then the rest of the day is a write off and you've spent your discharge grant. And then you just stick to what you know. And then you're back in the same old groove. And then you're back in the same old groove with the same people, or you've gone out and done a bit of shoplifting just so that you can earn some money for food, or you've, yeah. Do you achieve success? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm really lucky with P3. Within our role, we, with there's. So P3 is the acronym for people, people. potential possibilities, yeah. yeah. Um, we have a very small caseload that we do all intensively with as, um, complex cases, basically people that are usually got accommodation issues that might be rough sleeping, that have got underlying mental health concerns, um, substance misuse, 
that have fallen through the gaps in the system and our roles were link workers and we link people in to existing services. Why is there a specialist job where we need to link people in? Because you know the services are so fragmented, they're daunting. You have to have a level of organisation and it's even just having a phone. If you haven't got a phone in this day and age, mm. you, you just can't do the things Move you forwards. need to do. You could, yeah. Um, so, do we achieve success? We do. Our role is kind of around being that person, enabling, motivating those individuals, making them kind of believe, yes, you can do this, you can do this. It's not, it doesn't always have to be, excuse my language, but the shit you've always put up with, things can be different. I've done it. I know so many other people that I've worked with, as in other members of staff that I've had the privilege to work with along the way, that have made massive changes in their life. We've had clients that we've gotten through the, you know, the systems, people that we've got into their own local um, authority tenancies, their own flats after they've been sleeping rough for four years. Um, people that we've got into support accommodation, they've got into drug treatment, done volunteering, got off their probation order, kind of lived uh, the life they want to live, mm -hmm. you know, beyond that. It's never a quick fix. There's a lot of stuff in the news about the prisons and police and mental health. Um, you know, we all have to work together, but it's a long-term thing, you know. There's not a one... You're talking years, really, aren't you? Years, yeah, years. And the right support at the right time and for, the, you know, our clients to have a voice. That's the one thing we do with a lot of these services. Is, you know, a lot of services have written people off. There might be people that have been around the block, year on, year off, been in hostels, been out of hostels, been in drug treatment, been out of drug treatment. Oh, they're never gonna do it. Oh, they've been around, they're never gonna change. Majority, there's always a time when someone will change. That's what we always hope for. And for me personally, I've been doing this type of work for 10 years and for every person I've met, I've believed that they can change. If they're ready, we'll move heaven and earth to make sure that they can achieve the change they want. And I guess if you've got someone, I guess if you've got someone who does believe that that person sat in front of you, if somebody sat in front of you and you have, and they, that person's saying you can change, you can, you can deal with whatever it is that's causing you to take your drugs, um, then that's, that must be great because so, for so much of their life, People have said, oh, that person's always like that. They never change. They're going to go around the block. So, the, But to have someone saying, actually, I do believe you can change has got to be um, yeah. amazingly empowering if they're in the right place. Yeah. If, um, so if you, what would you say to, if you could t give a, a statement to, if there was someone in gospel who is um, in that sort of unhealthy relationship with um, substances, um, what would you say is one, is to do, the first thing they should do? The biggest thing is to stop hiding it. <laughs> if you're someone who's under the radar and you think, oh, I'm not that bad, if you're someone who's the last person in the pub, that everyone else is gone and you're still there at the parties, you're like, I'm going to carry on, I'm going to keep going, and you're the last one, maybe think, hmm, am I going a bit too far with this? Have a real word with yourself, a proper word with yourself. Is this becoming a problem? Is you must look at yourself in not... the mirror, honestly. Yeah, literally. You know, am I happy with this? Is this a problem? Am I in control still? Or is this controlling me a bit too much? If you've tried time after time to not drink on a Friday, Saturday, and you're still drinking on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, maybe it's time to just have a chat with somebody, be it a friend, be it you know, your GP if you're more comfortable, if you think things are really coming on top and you're using quite a few substances as well as alcohol, go and speak to Inclusion down in Gosport. In the precinct, yeah. Down at South Street, fantastic service, really warm, you know, open, welcoming, not there to judge, it's just literally have that conversation because the worst that's gonna happen is, you know, I remember from my own experience, I went into, <laughs> for a consultation meeting at the Priory in Marchwood, right? And I'd been absolutely caning it for years, but this one particular weekend, I knew that after that, I was gonna be sorting myself out. And I 
booked this consultation appointment and I went in there and explained to the guy what I'd been doing, the drugs I'd taken, how often I was drinking. And as I sat there, crying my eyes out, and I was like, do you think I've got a problem? Seriously, it, of course I had. And it's almost like I needed that validation from someone else that, yeah, actually, yeah, you're not all right, are you? <laughs> um, and that was my turning point, my moment, you know, everything collapsed. And <coughs> to have that conversation sooner rather than later is only ever going to be a good thing. Because the worst that will happen is they're saying, yeah, you know, there's not an issue or actually, what do you think, you know? Is it a bit like anything that we do that's pivotal in our life? We always think, God, I wish I'd done it so much sooner. Yeah, yeah, and you have to. That's probably the one thing, you know, from my own experiences, there's lots of things that I've kind of done regarding asking for help, you know, that pride gets in the way. That kind of, oh, everyone sees me in a certain way. I can't possibly say that I'm, I've got weakness of, of any description. Um, it's just ask for that help. How, um, so if you, if you compare your, how, first of all, sorry, how do you keep um, emotionally, how do you keep healthy now? Um, crikey. Do you know, I try and be as honest as I can about how, about my feelings. Um, having real connections, conversations with people, not just with my clients within my work, but also with kind of friends around me, let people in, let them be, let them be there for you. And um, vice versa. And vice, yeah. Um, and also kind of surround yourself with good nurturing things, and I never thought I'd say it, and I must sound really old, but, you know, things like, don't underestimate the value of going for a walk in the woods, you know, whatever the weather, just get out there, just have a walk, clear your head, properly listen, concentrate on like, the nature around you. Go up the allotment, you know, there's an allotment project in Gosport, but get out there, dig a blooming great hole, plant something, watch it grow, you know, brilliant, nurtures you. Go to the gym, bust your backside, work up a sweat, just do that stuff. Feel alive, really. Feel alive again, get your heart pounding, try something new. There's so many new experiences out there. If you're a bit creative, it doesn't have to be like, I can paint a picture, make something out of clay, I don't know, just sand something down, yeah. make something out of wood. We so spoke much. about um, how we, you work, we spoke about phones and social yeah. um, isolation. What's yeah. your, what, you said something I found quite interesting about phones. Yeah, what would phones. you say about a phone? Crikey. Hands up who spends an evening sat on eBay, Facebook, Gumtree and Instagram. And hands up who doesn't phone a friend or phone someone and have a chat. Yeah. What are we doing? I'm guilty of it, you know, I yeah. think a lot of people can relate to it. And I think we've, we're starting to really isolate ourselves enough, you know, a lot. We'll write about it on Facebook and Instagram. Look at me, this is me doing this, this is me doing that. Come on, let's just get, socialise again, learn how to do it again. That's important. If someone says to you in a messenger message, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm fine, how are you? How's things? Face to face, you know, you can then have a proper conversation. Yeah, and have want. a conversation, like you say, with a person on the bus or the person oh, who's, yeah. who's, who's serving yeah. your coffee or whatever. Rather than sitting on your phone on the bus. Oh, and you're ignoring everyone around you. And you know there's other people on the bus, in the shop, in the queue at the post office. That might be their only trip out of the whole week. And I'm not talking older people. There's the kind of stereotype that it's elderly people that only get out of the house once a week. It can be young people, older people, you know, and you're there, you're not seeing, you're not acknowledging. They're isolated already, and yet, you know, try and be cheerful, be kind to other people, just reach out. It doesn't have to be doing the sort of job I do where, you, you know. I think you're right. I think if, and that's the thing, isn't it? If you're kind to people, you don't do kindness or you don't give to get back, but actually the byproduct of being kind and giving is you actually get kindness and giving yeah. back. So it's kind of a win-win situation. Yeah. But you need it. It kind of feels if you're not used to it, you can you can feel a bit vulnerable, can't you, by doing that initially? Yeah, I guess and you've got quite, to overcome yeah. that. Then you get yeah. strong. But it is. Yeah. You so. I think you're doing a fantastic job, mm -hmm. and you're using your life experiences, which must be incredibly satisfying for you. Um, and I think you've 
you've certainly for me you've sort of given me an insight into kind of hopefully you know looking at people and not sort of you know because I you know I think you know even in my previous job you know why would anyone stick a needle in their arm mm -hmm. but actually I've been brought up with love and affection and that's that's what I know as normal and um that's my default if I'm feeling stressed or anything I'd go to my family and friends and get their love and support whereas if your default is that you're brought up in a family where substances are used and they are used as a coping strategy then it's almost in your DNA yeah so it must be an incredibly hard battle yeah. to overcome yeah so um and you never give up on them never I've never get the day I think you know what no way you never amount is the day I will take myself out of the job. I will walk away. Yeah, and you must see people come again yeah, and again and again. Time after time after time, and you know what? And it's still just that encouragement. It's like, but you can do this, and it's focusing on the positives. Because that you one know? chance, that one time, might be the right time for everything to fall into place for them. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. it's lovely. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>